look upon the medieval world, a tableau rife with mystery and allure, setting the stage for a series of events that thundered across continents, altering the course of human history, the Crusades. An epoch where faith and fervor, ambition and despair danced a grim ballet upon the stage of the known world. While the romance of these tales captures the imagination, let us not overlook the harsh geopolitical realities that birthed this era. The Byzantine Empire, a colossus teetering on the brink, the Seljuk Turks' relentless advance. These were not mere backdrops, but catalysts for the call to arms. And what of the motivations attributed to these crusaders? Pope Urban II's call at Clermont, draped in the divine, was no less a political maneuver, aimed as much at rallying Europe under a common cause as it was at aiding the Byzantines. The veneer of religiosity barely conceals the socio-political chess game that was unfolding. Yet, can we deny the fervor that gripped the hearts of those who marched? There was a belief, however misguided, in a righteous cause, in the defense of Christian lands, in the sanctity of their mission. This belief drove men to endure the harshness of their journey and the horrors of war. Beliefs often mask more sordid motivations. Greed, lust for power, revenge, the massacres and sieges perpetrated in these so-called holy wars laid bare the lengths to which men would go, cloaking their basest desires in the guise of divine will. And amidst the clash and clamor of battle, we find tales of individual zeal, of leaders and soldiers, driven by a tapestry of motives, pure and impure. The chronicles of the Crusades are filled not just with tales of conflict, but with stories of human nature laid bare. As we delve into this discussion, remember that history is a mirror reflecting our virtues and vices. The Crusades, with their complex weave of faith, ambition, and human frailty, offer us a clear reflection of mankind's perpetual struggle between lofty ideals and earthly desires. Let us begin by delving into the murky waters that gave rise to the First Crusade. An event, I dare say, that has been cloaked in both sanctity and vilification through the annals of time. Indeed, Herodotus. But let us not forget the essential role of geopolitical dynamics. The Byzantine Empire was a shell of its former glory, weakened by internal strife and external pressure from the advancing Seljuk Turks. The call for the crusade was as much a plea for aid as it was a strategic maneuver to preserve what remained of Byzantine influence in the East. A strategic maneuver, you say, Polybius. But let's not overlook the cunning behind Pope Urban II's call. It was a masterstroke of real politic, masked in the cloaks of piety. By promising absolution and eternal glory, he mobilized a fragmented Europe against a common enemy under the guise of religious fervor. Ah, but the human spirit cannot be so easily categorized, dear Thucydides. Many a soul set forth on those treacherous paths driven by dreams of divine favor, land, and wealth. The stories of individuals emboldened by faith and the lure of adventure paint a vivid picture of the crusade's personal appeal. Dreams of divine favor or not, the consequences of these personal motivations were as real as the blood spilled on the battleground. The socio-political context of Europe at the time, fraught with power struggles and the desire for expansion, cannot be understated. Religious veneer aside, the Crusades were a testament to human ambition and the lengths to which it will go in the name of supremacy. Ambition, yes, but also necessity. The rise of the Seljuk Turks posed a direct threat to the Christian lands and way of life. The Byzantine appeal for aid was not merely a call to arms, but a desperate plea for survival in the face of encroaching forces. And yet, it was this very melding of piety, desperation, and ambition that set the stage for one of history's most contentious chapters. A series of events that would forever alter the landscape of the East and West. Forever alter, indeed, for the call at Clermont was not merely a battle cry, but a pivotal moment that reshaped the geopolitical boundaries and religious dynamics of the medieval world. It was a calculated political maneuver that exploited the collective sentiment of Europe's populace, guiding it towards a singular, albeit bloody, purpose. A maneuver that, despite its immediate military objectives, set in motion a sequence of events whose repercussions reverberate through the annals of history, fundamentally altering the course of East-West relations. Could it be then that in their quest for the Holy Land, driven by a melange of faith, ambition, and geopolitical necessity, 
the Crusaders unwittingly laid the foundation for centuries of conflict and cooperation that would define Christian-Muslim relations. The answers, like the tales of old, are not black and white, but reside in the shades of gray that history so often presents us. Now let us delve into the murky waters of Christian-Muslim relations during the Crusades. The bloodshed and brutality, are they merely scars on the face of history, or have they seeded a legacy of mistrust and division? The Crusades carved deep fissures between Christian and Muslim worlds. It's not merely about the battles or the sieges. The narrative of Christian valor against Muslim infidels has been romanticized. But let's not forget, it's a history written in blood. The siege of Jerusalem, the massacre at Antioch, these were not just military endeavors. They were ideological statements, exacerbating tensions between faiths that continue to echo into our present. Yet, one must consider, were these crusades not, in their heart, a defense of Christian lands, an echo of the ancient calling to protect one's hearth and sacred sites from encroachment? It's simplistic to cast this as mere aggression. Jerusalem, after all, holds significance not just for Christians, but for the Jewish and Muslim faiths as well. The quest to reclaim it was not solely a venture of plunder. Speaking of interactions, it was not all bloodshed and hatred. Amidst the carnage, there were moments of startling humanity. Christians and Muslims traded, shared knowledge, even showed courtesy to one another at times. It's these nuances that defy the simplistic narratives of eternal animosity. For instance, the respect shown by Saladin towards Richard the Lionheart stands out as a counterpoint to the prevailing tales of unmitigated hatred. Both of you glance over a crucial point, the effect of these confrontations on the societal structures of both worlds. The animosity and respect you speak of are but surface currents over a deep sea of socio-political maneuvering. The Crusades were not just battles over land or ideological dominance. They reshaped the political landscapes of the regions involved influencing alliances, power dynamics, and even contributing to the shifting sands of identity and statecraft. It seems our discussion unfolds a tapestry of conflict and cooperation, hatred and respect. The Crusades indeed shaped the Christian-Muslim relations in ways that are intricate and profound. And let us not overlook the human cost of these ambitions. The narratives of heroism and honor do little to console the generations that bore the brunt of these conflicts. The Crusades are a testament to the folly of believing that ideological purity justifies the horrors inflicted upon fellow men. Yet, history shows us that from shared adversity can spring unexpected cooperation and mutual respect. Should we not then ponder upon the seeds of understanding that were sown amongst the thorns of conflict? As our discourse winds through the legacies of these historic encounters, it's clear the Crusades left a complex web of scars and ties between Christian and Muslim worlds. The challenge for modernity is to untangle this web, to learn from the past with an eye toward forging a future where such divisions can be bridged with understanding and peace. Let's delve into the pragmatic outcomes of the Crusades in the Levant. Polybius, would you say these military campaigns forged the initial links in what became the chain of global trade? Indeed, Herodotus. The establishment of crusader states did not merely serve as a bridgehead for military ambitions, but morphed the Mediterranean into a bustling marketplace. Europeans thirsted for Eastern goods, spices, silk, and knowledge. This necessity drove an expansion of trade networks, but at what cost? It altered the balance of power, enticing European states to explore and eventually dominate sea routes to the east. Ah, but think of the spirit it instilled in our crusaders, Polybius. Venturing into unknown lands, these men were not mere invaders but harbingers of a new era of commerce and cultural exchange. Their bravery brought back not only riches, but enlightenment from the east. How can one overlook the ambition that propelled Christendom into a broader worldview? brilliance and bravery you see, Livy. I see opportunism and exploitation. Yes, trade routes expanded, but let's be clear. The primary beneficiaries were the merchant classes and the monarchs who endorsed these campaigns. And what of the local populations? Subjugated, displaced, with their own economies upturned, 
the Crusades instigated economic upheaval that had ramifications far beyond the immediate gain of European traders. Thucydides, your skepticism, though harsh, bears weight. Yet, can we not acknowledge that these economic expansions laid the groundwork for what we now understand as globalization? Despite the tumult, the melding of Eastern and Western economies seeded a cultural and intellectual exchange unparalleled in history. An exchange indeed, but at a steep price. Tacitus, your thoughts? The fruits of these endeavors, while sweet for Europe, bore a bitter taste for others. You speak of trade and cultural exchange as if they purify the sins of conquest. Let's not adorn the narrative with the laurels of progress when the reality was marred by blood. The siege of cities, the massacres, tell me, were these also necessary for trade? The Crusades were draped in the guise of holy war, but beneath lay the unquenchable thirst for wealth and dominance. And yet, amidst these conflicts, one cannot ignore the individuals whose stories weave through this narrative of commerce and conquest. Personal ambition, the promise of wealth, led many a crusader to feats of bravery and brutality. Their deeds, inscribed in both history and legend, reveal a human face to these campaigns. It's these personal tales that intrigue, stories of individuals who navigated through these newly forged trade networks, sometimes forging alliances with the very cultures their comrades sought to suppress. So we see that ambition, whether for wealth, land, or salvation, propelled the Crusades beyond mere military expeditions, transforming them into catalysts for change, economic, cultural, and political. Yet this change was double-edged, carving paths for exchange and understanding while sowing seeds of enduring conflict and exploitation. Let's delve into the influence of the Crusades on European military innovations. The Crusaders' encounters with Muslim forces ushered in significant changes in warfare. Thucydides, you often stress the importance of strategy. How do you view these adaptations? Indeed, the necessity breeds innovation. The Crusades exposed European forces to the superior mobility and tactics of their Muslim adversaries. The adaptation of heavier cavalry and the introduction of siege warfare are prime examples. These were pragmatic responses to the challenges faced in foreign lands, reflecting a shift towards more strategic and calculated approaches to warfare, a movement away from relying solely on brute force. Yet let us not adorn failure with the laurels of innovation too hastily. The Crusades were marked by a series of harsh lessons learned through bitter defeat. The introduction of new military strategies and the stark realities of Crusader warfare demonstrate not so much an evolution of military thought as they do a grueling trial by fire. The effectiveness of these new strategies was bought with the blood of countless soldiers, a cost seldom acknowledged. Both perspectives highlight the complexity of military innovation during the Crusades. From my vantage point, the broader implications of these advancements cannot be overstated. European kingdoms later leveraged these military techniques in their own territorial expansions, setting the stage for a global shift in warfare. This integration of new tactics and technology forged in the crucible of the Crusades became a cornerstone of European military prowess. While the tactical and technological advancements are noteworthy, I'm more intrigued by the personal valor and the deeds of the military leaders themselves. Take Richard the Lionheart, for example whose strategies and leadership became legendary. Yet, the focus on technological innovation barely scratches the surface of what truly defined the military legacy of the Crusades. It is the tales of individual bravery and leadership that capture the imagination. I beg to differ. Focusing solely on individual prowess misses the forest for the trees. The true influence of the Crusades on military innovation lies in the collective European response to a new kind of warfare. The adaptation and adoption of siege technology, for instance, were not the whims of single leaders, but a necessary evolution in response to fortified cities. This collective shift towards organized military engineering and strategy heralds a significant departure from prior methods of warfare. Let us then traverse to the political aftermath the Crusades bequeathed upon the Byzantine Empire a dominion once resplendent, grappling with both its internal decay and external pressures. Indeed, the Crusades, 
under the guise of religious liberation, ended up amplifying the Byzantine Empire's vulnerability. Initially, Alexios Fur's plea for mercenary support against the Seljuks was a strategic move, yet it inadvertently invited a deluge that would erode Byzantine sovereignty. My analyses of military strategies reveal that alliances, poorly construed and executed, often lead to disastrous outcomes. The Crusades exemplified this. Ah, the Byzantine Empire, a study in the art of political decay. Its reliance on foreign crusaders was a double-edged sword. Venice, taking advantage of the Fourth Crusade, turned its fleet towards Constantinople, not out of piety, but greed. The sack of Constantinople in 1204 was a brutal testament to the venality that underpinned these so-called holy wars. The Crusades, thus, facilitated the rise of maritime republics like Venice at the expense of Byzantine influence. Alas, it pains the heart to witness such missed opportunities for unity between the East and West. Instead of forging a lasting alliance against common foes, the Crusades sowed deeper divisions. There were moments, flickers of potential for harmonious coexistence and mutual defense. Yet, these were extinguished by greed and betrayal. The Byzantine Empire's story during the Crusades is a tragic episode of what could have been a prosperous collaboration eroded by short-sighted ambitions. Let us not be swayed by romantic notions of what could have been. The Byzantine Empire's strategic blunders and internal corruption made its decline almost inevitable. The Crusades merely accelerated this process. The Fourth Crusade's diversion to Constantinople was not an anomaly, but a reflection of the Crusades' true nature, not as noble quests, but as expeditions marred by opportunism and the pursuit of power. A poignant reflection indeed. Each conquest and alliance during the Crusades seems to underscore a broader theme of human history. The pursuit of power often undermines the very foundations we seek to preserve. The Byzantine Empire, in its bid to reclaim lost territories and secure its borders, ultimately became a victim of its own ambitions, entangled in the web of Crusader politics. Precisely. And let's not overlook the aftermath of these crusading endeavors on the Byzantine military apparatus and economic infrastructure, which were strained to their breaking points. The frequent passing of armies through its territories wreaked havoc, further destabilizing an already precarious situation. Destruction, upheaval, and betrayal. The legacy of the Crusades on Byzantium serves as a grim reminder of the futility of seeking salvation through warfare and alliances with duplicitous powers. The sack of Constantinople laid bare the craven heart of Christendom's warrior class. Yet there is a tragic beauty in the resilience of the Byzantine spirit, surviving centuries beyond these calamities, preserving knowledge and culture amidst the ruins of its once mighty empire. The lessons from its interactions with the Crusades are timeless, emphasizing the need for wisdom and foresight in statecraft. Indeed, the annals of history teach us not only of glory and conquest, but also of the hubris that precedes the fall. The Byzantine Empire's dance with the Crusades illustrates the ephemeral nature of power and the enduring legacy of the choices made by those who wield it. Diving into the tempest stirred by the Crusades in the Middle East's political landscape, one cannot overlook the meteoric rise of Saladin. His leadership not only galvanized Muslim forces, but altered the very bedrock of Middle Eastern politics. Yet it would be remiss to view this through a simplistic lens of conquest and resistance. Indeed, the notion that Saladin's ascension and the unification of Muslim territories was merely a reaction to the Crusades is an oversimplification. It was as much about internal struggles and the vacuum of power as it was about repelling invaders. The Crusades, one could argue, accelerated existing processes, bringing to the fore leaders of remarkable capability and vision. Speaking of remarkable leaders, Richard the Lionheart's presence in the Crusades offers a fascinating counterpoint to Saladin. Both men, lionized in history, wielded charisma and military acumen in equal measure. Contemporary accounts lavish praise on their prowess, yet they were not merely warriors but astute politicians, exploiting the era's turmoil to their advantage. And yet the irony of Crusader states, ostensibly bulwarks of Christendom's easternmost frontier, ensnared in the web of local politics, cannot be overstated. 
what began as a holy endeavor quickly devolved into a quagmire of alliances, betrayals, and Machiavellian machinations. The purported clarity of their mission blurred, revealing the Crusades' inherent contradictions. Moreover, one must not ignore the transformation of not just political landscapes, but of military strategies and administrative practices. Saladin's leadership exemplified adaptability, learning from both victories and defeats. This period catalyzed significant shifts in governance and warfare, underscoring the multidimensional impact of the Crusades beyond mere territorial disputes. Yet, amidst this discussion of strategic brilliance and political acumen, let us not forget the lamentable toll these conflicts exacted on the populace. The shifting political landscapes, while fertile ground for leaders like Saladin and Richard, were often wastelands for the common people, whose lives were irrevocably altered by the ceaseless marches of armies across their lands. A point well made, stirring the reminder that the echoes of the Crusades, particularly in the political domain, resonated not in the empty halls of power, but in the lived realities of the era's peoples. The Crusades facilitated a crucible of change, with leaders like Saladin and Richard navigating the tumultuous currents of their time, often leaving indelible marks on history's canvas. Let us now turn our attention to the fascinating interplay of cultures, the mingling of East and West during the Crusades. A time when, despite the clashing of swords, there was an exchange of knowledge. Indeed, the Crusades were not merely about subjugation or purging infidels. They inadvertently paved the way for a rich exchange. The Crusader states acted as conduits. Through them flowed spices, silk, and most importantly, knowledge. This was pragmatic conquest, where the booty was not always tangible. While it's true that there was cultural exchange, let's not romanticize these interactions too grandly. The primary motive was conquest and religious fervor, not scholarly pursuit. Yes, advances in medicine, mathematics, and architecture were made through these exchanges, but they were byproducts of a far more violent quest. Yet, you cannot deny the individual stories that emerge from these encounters. Take, for instance, the translation efforts in places such as Toledo, where scholars from various backgrounds collaborated. This wasn't just accidental. These were deliberate meetings of minds. Even amidst strife, there were those who sought understanding and knowledge, translating works from Arabic into Latin, and thus seeding the Renaissance. It is the tale of humanity, is it not? Even in our darkest hours, our insatiable curiosity leads us to enlightenment. The Crusaders, despite their primary aims of conquest, could not help but bring back to Europe the refined luxuries and sophisticated culture they encountered. This exposure would inevitably lead to a blossoming, a renewal of thought that Europe so desperately needed. But at what cost? The cultural exchange you so glorify came with the blood of thousands. The fragile bridges built between East and West, walked upon by the few interested in cultural understanding, were paved by the many whose lives were seen as expendable. Let's not paint a romantic picture when the canvas is smeared with blood. Yes, the cost was indeed high, and the motivations may not have been pure. Yet history has a way of extracting beauty from tragedy, wisdom from folly. The Crusades, for all their brutality, served as a crucible for cultural and intellectual exchange, which would leave an indelible mark on the annals of history. This, however, raises a pertinent question about the nature of human progress. Is it inherent in our species to advance only through conflict and conquest? Our discussion seems to hint at a grim acceptance of violence as a catalyst for cultural synthesis and intellectual advancements. It is a pattern too often seen in history. Progress, more often than not, is born out of adversity and conflict. Yet it is not the only path. The exchanges during the Crusades remind us that understanding and cooperation can yield the same, if not richer, fruits. True, the stories of individuals pushing for knowledge and exchange amidst turmoil are testament to the human spirit's unyielding drive for understanding and betterment, even in the darkest of times. And thus, history teaches us once again. In the midst of desolation, there lies the potential for regeneration and enlightenment. The Crusades, a fiery trial, proved that even in conflict, the seeds of a new dawn can be sown. So as we reflect on this era of unparalleled conflict and interaction, 
let us recognize the complexity of human pursuits. Even in war, the quest for knowledge and the desire for understanding can forge unexpected pathways to a brighter future. Let us delve into the Crusades' deep mark on medieval society and the feudal system. Polybius, how do you see the weakening of the feudal nobility as influencing the centralized power of the monarchies? The essence of the matter is prosaically strategic. Consider the nobility, emboldened by piety or greed, embarked on these crusades, and in doing so, many lost their lives or their fortunes. This vacuum of power did not create silence. Rather, it beckoned the rise of centralized royal authority. Kings consolidated power, not out of ambition alone, but necessity to fill the void left by a diminished nobility. Historical cycles are relentless. The strong seize the moment, and the Crusades provided just such a fulcrum for change. Yet, one must not overlook the machinations behind such shifts. The weakening of the nobility and the consequent rise of the monarchies were not merely accidental byproducts. They were, in some instances, facilitated or even engineered outcomes. Kingdoms became more bureaucratic, more militaristically sophisticated out of the sheer necessity to manage what the Crusades had unraveled. Thus, the Crusades acted as a catalyst for a transformation that was perhaps inevitable, given the underlying tensions within the feudal system. A lamentable evolution, I must say. The dislocation and hardships faced by those who tilled the soil, the peasants, are a testament to the human cost of ambition and war. Yet, amidst this turmoil, the ideal of serving one's lord and land, which the Crusades, in theory, aimed to embody, became diluted. It is a poignant reminder of the fragility of societal structures when faced with the maelstrom of conquest and zeal. Your lamentation, Livy, while poetic, somewhat glosses over the stark reality. The feudal system was already a cauldron of exploitation and inequality. Yes, the Crusades expedited certain shifts, but to mourn the evolution of societal structures under such conditions is to overlook the inherent injustices they perpetuated. The real politic of the era was brutal and unyielding. The Crusades merely laid bare the voracious appetite for power and control inherent in medieval governance. Speaking of power dynamics, the rise of the merchant classes cannot be overlooked. The abrupt departure of the ruling nobility created not just a power vacuum, but economic opportunities for those shrewd enough to seize them. It's akin to the stories of the emperors I've chronicled, where the demise of one leads to the unlikely rise of another. These merchants, through their newly acquired wealth, began to wield an influence that would have been unthinkable prior to the Crusades. The narrative of history, it seems, is often written by those who adeptly navigate the chaos of their times. Indeed, the transformation of society and its structures in the wake of the Crusades is a complex tapestry of ambition, loss, and the unquenchable thirst for power. Yet it also speaks to the resilience of humanity, to adapt, to evolve, and to find new ways of organizing itself amid the ashes of the old. The Crusades, for all their brutality and fervor, also sparked a renaissance of sorts in the way societies structured themselves and interacted with one another, the fact, a paradox that continues to fascinate and haunt us in equal measure. Delving into the knights and chivalry, one cannot help but marvel at the shimmering facade the Crusades have lent to the medieval period. Is this not a reflection of human desire for noble ideals amidst the grim reality of war? Indeed, Herodotus. The Crusades, for all their violence, gave birth to the chivalric code, a beacon of honor, valor, and courtesy, in an age overrun by darkness. Tales of knights errant, not unlike our Roman heroes, emboldened men to seek glory beyond mere conquest. It was a golden age, where the martial virtues of the ancients were reborn in the medieval knight. A golden age, Livy? Or perhaps a gilded one, thinly veiling the brutality inflicted in the name of these so-called virtues? The chivalric code served more as a justification for slaughter than as a genuine moral compass. The disparity between the ideals of chivalry and the reality of crusader conduct was vast and often horrifying. In my accounts, I've told of emperors and their deeds, yet even they pale in comparison to the stories of knights, such as the Templars and Hospitallers. These orders, cloaked in piety and mystique, carried out acts of both cruelty and valor. 
Their legacy is a complex tapestry of myth and reality, fascinating in its contradictions. Allow me to interject with a pragmatic observation. The establishment of knightly orders and the concept of chivalry brought about a significant evolution in military tactics and political strategy. Whether for better or worse, they institutionalized the militarization of Christian society under the guise of piety and honor, profoundly impacting the political landscapes of Europe and beyond. And yet, Polybius, would it not be wise to question the very foundation of this chivalric ideal? How many times must history repeat itself before we learn that lofty ideals often mask the pursuit of power and vanity? The Crusades and the knightly orders that arose from them are prime examples of this phenomenon. They sought to cloak ambition and wrath under the veil of righteousness and chivalric duty. While each of you presents compelling arguments, it appears the legacy of chivalry and knightly orders is as complex as the Crusades themselves. Shrouded in both light and shadow, they continue to stir our imaginations and incite debate over their true impact on history and morality. Herodotus, history teaches us lessons, and the chivalric code, despite its flaws, aimed to uplift human character. Should we not honor that intent, even if its application fell short? Honor intent, perhaps. But let us not romanticize or whitewash history. The true cost of these ambitions must also be acknowledged, for it is paid in the currency of human suffering. A profound point, Tacitus. The complexity of human nature and society indeed oftentimes reveals a stark divergence between lofty ideals and the murky realities of their pursuit. Let us now pivot to the enduring aftermath of the Crusades, the ripples through time that shaped civilizations on either side of the great religious divide. The legacy, it seems, is as layered as the societies it touched. Indeed, Herodotus. The geopolitical boundaries we see today are shadows cast by those ancient conflicts. Europe solidified its identity against a perceived other, while the Islamic world did much the same. The delineation of these spheres has been a driving force in diplomatic and military engagements for centuries. It's the irony of unintended outcomes that fascinates me. The Crusades, intended to secure Christian dominions, instead set the stage for centuries of conflict, trade, and cultural exchange. This interaction, while often hostile, also paved the way for a degree of mutual respect and intellectual curiosity that arguably led to the Renaissance. I find it hard to join in your admiration, Thucydides. The loss of life, the desecration of sacred lands, the broken promises, all for what? Temporary victories on both sides that led to enduring strife? Yet I cannot deny that through these dark times, there were moments where humanity's better angels prevailed, in art, literature, and even in the code of chivalry that rose from the ashes. Your better angels often came with swords, Livy. The rise of knightly orders and their so-called code of chivalry was more a justification for continued aggression and subjugation than a noble pursuit. The Templars, the Hospitallers, their deeds have been romanticized, but let us not forget their origins in violence and their roles in the machinery of war. While Tacitus paints with a rather broad brush, it's impossible to ignore the spectacle and drama of these orders. Personal ambitions, betrayals, legendary exploits, these were the currency of the Crusades. The tales of Richard the Lionheart and Saladin, for instance, capture the imagination, but they also remind us of the complexity of human character and the paradoxes of history. A fair point, Suetonius. The Crusades, for all their brutality, were also a crucible for the exchange of knowledge. Arabic works on science, mathematics, and philosophy were translated into Latin, seeding intellectual growth in Europe. This exchange was not one of equals, but it was pivotal in shaping the intellectual landscape of the West. And yet, let us not view this through rose-colored glasses. The cultural exchange came at a tremendous human cost. The consolidation of power, the mapping of new trade routes, the military innovations, these were not merely academic exercises. They were bought with blood and born from conquest. As always, the duality of human endeavors is evident progress and regress, enlightenment and ignorance, coexisting in the historical narrative. The Crusades were no different, setting a complex stage for future encounters between East and West. It forces us to question, does the end justify the means? The Crusades are a testament to the depths of human conviction, 
but also to the folly of believing that divine favor can justify mortal atrocities. Mankind's capacity for self-deception knows no bounds. We dress our ambitions in the garb of righteousness and wonder why the tapestry unravels. The Crusades were a lesson in the limits of ideology when it collides with the unyielding complexity of the human condition. And so our discussion circles back to the duality of human nature and history. The Crusades, with their legacy of conflict and cooperation, serve as a mirror reflecting our own times. The past, it seems, is ever-present, urging us to look beyond the clashing of swords and the chance of zealots to find our shared humanity. As we draw this discussion to a close, it's clear the Crusades were more than mere conflict. They were a catalyst for profound change. Let's delve into our final thoughts, beginning with you, Thucydides. The examination of the Crusades serves as a salient reminder that history, in all its complexity, must not be oversimplified. The confluence of motivations, whether for piety, plunder, or power, underscores the multifaceted nature of human endeavors. It is imperative we grasp the Crusades beyond the binary of victory and defeat, seeing them through the prism of their repercussions on cultures, economies, and geopolitical landscapes. Continuing on that, the geopolitical aftershocks of the Crusades have left indelible marks on both East and West. The delineation of spheres of influence and the subsequent political maneuvers speak to a legacy of division but also of unavoidable interdependence. It prompts a reflection on the present, urging us to consider how past conflicts shape our current geopolitical challenges. Yet, amidst the turmoil and transformations, one must not overlook the moral and ethical dimensions. The Crusades underscore the peril of allowing zealous ambition and ideological fervor to dictate actions. They serve as a testament to the importance of understanding and empathy over conquest and division. As historians, we must seize these lessons to enlighten future generations. It's quaint, Livy, to hear talk of moral lessons from a time so drenched in blood for reasons often as base as greed under a guise of piety. The human cost, the lives expended in pursuit of these so-called holy missions, places a somber cloud over any talk of advancements or cultural exchanges. The narratives spun around the Crusades often mask the grim reality of human suffering and societal upheaval. And amidst the cacophony of war and conquest, personal stories emerge that captivate the imagination. The lives of figures like Saladin and Richard the Lionheart offer us glimpses into leadership, chivalry, and the personal motivations that drove the Crusades. These stories, while not devoid of misconstruction, provide texture to the historical tapestry, enriching our understanding of an era defined by its contradictions and complexities. The dialogue we've shared here today is but a glimpse into the vast panorama the Crusades offer to the student of history. They are a mirror reflecting humanity's best and worst, our capacity for greatness and for destruction, for unity and for division. History does not repeat itself, but it does instruct, it does warn, and, if we're judicious, it enlightens. As we part, let this discussion be a reminder that history, with all its intricacies, is not merely the past. It's a continuous dialogue with the present and future.